this, this since from basic to population aspects, we as clinicians, we are navigating in a dark state, I would say. We don't have randomized trials, we don't have a database or lab to database to, to deal with. So this is a new moment, a new area. Uh, in this way, or looking at this aspect that we plan this webinar with the purpose of learning uh, a little bit more about the disease, specifically about the cardiovascular aspects in almost a real time and exchanging experience. So let me first introduce myself and our panel. My name is Chris Polanczyk. I'm professor of medicine and chief of the cardiology division here at HMD. Here with me, I have Professor Leandro Zimmerman. He is the coordinator. He is also professor of medicine, coordinator of the arrhythmia and electrophysiology unit here at the HMD. And uh, Luis Nazi is also with us, uh, our chief of medical officer at HMV, but also intensivist and cardiologist, and the leading person or the leading physician of all COVID-19 contingent plan at our hospital. And it's a great pleasure to have you both here, Professor Mohamed Latif. Professor Latif, he is the medical director of the interventional cardiology with a clinical focus on a lot of coronary intervention, complex disease, as well as structural disease, and member of several cardiology organizations such as American College of Cardiology and European Society of Cardiology. And also, we, it's a pleasure to have João Pontes. João is Brazilian, but he's an assistant professor of medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, an invasive cardiologist. I'd like to thank you both for agreeing, for taking this time off uh, in such a busy schedule, I can imagine, and for the opportunity of sharing with us uh, the ongoing experience with COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, first, let me just say that we are really, really sorry uh, following and hearing from the news what's going on in the US and around the world, especially in the New York States, and we hope that this will end soon for all of us. And just, for us to start, uh, I would like just to give a description to our audience uh, what we prepare for today. First, Dr. Fontes, we give an update of the epidemic situation in the U.S. and New York, followed by a presentation and discussion uh, 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 regarding two patients assisted at Mount Fiore Hospital. And then we can open to uh, questions and answers in a little bit, uh, hear from uh, our experts about the case. John and Professor Latif, thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you for the opportunity. It's our pleasure and honor to share our experience here in New York. Um, you know, we really are the epicenter of the epidemic in the U.S. and now, unfortunately, have the highest numbers um, of patients infected, but also deaths. Um, that's comparable to some of the more than many of the countries out there. Um, so. I'll leave it to Zhao to really give you more of the insights into uh, where we stand with the, with the pandemic here in New York. Uh, thank you, Dr. Latib, and thank you uh, for inviting us. Um, I would like to say a couple uh, words before I go to the formal introduction. Uh, Dr. Latib is the uh, Lionel Messi of the Structural Cardiology World and has been a wonderful uh, recruitment to our institution and has been able to you know, really get some conference calls with San Rafael Hospital in Milan uh, a couple of weeks ago. He put us ahead of, you know, the, the curve so we could prepare adequately. And Miguel is a wonderful fellow, uh, has been invited to join us as faculty member in July, did, uh, you know, some interesting research at the Duke University and NASA prior to joining Yale Medical School for Residency and Montefiore for Cardiology Fellowship and now in Interventional Fellowship. So I think it hopefully will be a good discussion. And we're, you know, unfortunately we are at the you know, peak of the epidemic right now and we have more cases than any city in the entire world. But hopefully uh, at least you can learn from where we have experience here and make, you know, the response in Brazil better. So I'm just going to share a couple of slides here uh, with you. I hope you guys are able to see now. Um, and so this is uh, Montefiore Medical Center. We are in the Bronx and we cover about 2 million people in our uh, area, in the borough of the Bronx. And essentially, uh, as you know, uh, one of the things that is very concerning about this virus is that even people who are asymptomatic are able to transmit the disease. 
So this paper from the New England Journal of Medicine shows like a regular meeting that took place in Germany and how many people got infected. And, you know, no one really knew at the time that this kind of like infection human to human was possible. And, you know, even people asymptomatic, which makes the disease uh, control spread and, you know, the opening of the economy down the road, things that it will be complicated. Obviously, another paper that came out of the New England Journal of Medicine showed that, you know, this virus not only is highly transmissible and contagious, but also lingered around in different areas, in copper, cardboard, stainless steel, and plastic, which makes like cleaning and disinfection paramount to avoid the spread, especially in the hospital system. Because, you know, one patient gets there, if you don't clean the room appropriately, you know, the next patient will have COVID, even if it was negative to begin with. Sharing some of the bad news, uh, this weekend I was on call uh, and we had MHS, is the Montefiore Health System. We had 2,037 cases that were admitted in our hospital system. In New York State, they have 190,000 at in that time. In the US, over half a million. So you can see that the curve was like, you know, still trending up and the idea of like flattening the curve is paramount but you know we've been uh pretty good in new york city i guess over the last two or three weeks of trying to get people to perform the social isolation and stay uh home so this is from yesterday so the good news here is that we have certainly passed the peak so we have fewer cases now than we had three days ago still a large amount of cases we have over 1,800 cases. Now in the New York State area, have 200,000. And, you know, worldwide is about 2 million. Uh, but good news, social isolation does work. And we're finally seeing uh, this downtrending of the curve, which is so important for the medical response. Uh, to have an idea about how this trend has been performing over the last couple of weeks, this is data that is available from our chair of medicine, Dr. Tomer, who's been sharing with us on a daily basis so we can all be aware of the situation. And also in New York State, you can see that thankfully, the number of total hospitalizations in the state of New York has decreased. The number of ICU admissions has also decreased, but you know the numbers are high and staggering, as you can see. Uh, the, Excellent news is that to this date, Montefiore Health System has been able to send over 2,600 people back home. So we hear a lot about the awful disease process and how many patients, you know, unfortunately don't make it once they are ventilated and in ICUs. But the truth is about, you know, two thirds to three quarters of patients with our support of here, you know, thankfully can go back home. Uh, so I think this is another curve showing that how New York State, we are finally flattening the curve. And the couple of things that we did uh, before we got here was the Department of Medicine uh, was mandated by the state of New York to increase capacity about 50%. We created over 11 new ICUs, over almost like, you know, it's now over 40 COVID teams. And we developed an increased testing in-house we moved to telemedicine as an outpatient. So essentially we would avoid unnecessary use of PPE and also avoid unnecessary physical presence of patients. And we develop a command center for critical care. So essentially a lot of like these decisions were changing on a day-to-day -day basis, but we kind of like develop a lot of like uh, increasing capacity so we could respond to this crisis appropriately. Uh, this, uh, Graph and figure has been widely circulated. It's from the paper from the Brigham. Some of my friends from you know, Sao Paulo sent me, which was great. I think we're all on the same page. I think that one of the interesting things about this disease process and time course is that we start with a viral response phase, which is followed by you know, a pulmonary phase, which most patients are hypoxic and present with ARDS. And finally, the most concerning phase is when they get to develop what's so-called the cytokine swarm. Uh, which is a dramatic response and something that it's very tricky and difficult to treat. The reason why this graph is in interesting is that it shows this not only the time course, but the potential therapies that should be applied at every single aspect, from the antiretrovirals to immunomodulators, steroids, and you know more interesting medications. So as you know, there have not been any major clinical trials that have shown any response of any particular drug to this date. However, we are at Montefiore enrolling patients for different trials to see if we can help out with this, you know, uh, the science-driven approach to this disease. Uh, one of the trials is the remdesivir, 
which is enrolling about 440 patients in 54 sites. I can tell you that to this moment, we have been able to enroll over 40 patients. So we are number two recruitment sites in the United States. And you can see here is essentially, we're trying to uh, take a look at the antiretroviral efficacy uh, for treatment. Some of the data of like uh, Rindesivir has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine recently over the weekend. And this is different from a clinical trial. This is the first look at the compassionate use of uh, Rindesivir in patients who have been admitted with uh, ARDS essentially from COVID-19. Uh, the data is promising. You can see that obviously this is not a very rigorous, you know, double blinded control clinical trial, but it does show that, you know, from the patients who have been given this drug, there is some evidence of a benefit. So this is promising, yet we do need to have more patients enrolled in the, uh, RCTs. We are also doing a different clinical trial. Uh, so it's a phase two, phase three B, essentially trying to enroll about 300 patients of a monoclonal antibody for the chemokine CCR5 receptor. So essentially uh, uh, lironlimab. We're trying to see if, you know, again, we can come up with any data for this. Cerulimab is another one that is very well known for the rheumatologists, and I think it's a very reasonable drug to use uh, based on the pathophysiology of the cytokine storm. Uh, we're enrolling uh, the you know clinical trial number is over there, and essentially so far, having enrolled over sixty patients, some of the doctor experience does say, suggest that you know patients respond to better. But again, we have to wait for the clinical trials to find out. Caletra is another trial that has been used, and I think we're going to uh, allude to this in the cases discussed by Dr. Latib and Dr. Alvarez. Uh, the initial clinical trial that was presented in New England about like three or four weeks ago, it wasn't particularly positive, as you can see. Again, was not the largest clinical trial. Uh, the methodology wasn't the best. But the concern is, if you take a look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, there is some suggestion of cumulative improvement with uh, Caletra uh, over control small numbers, not the best design. We still need to see the results of the clinical data. Finally, I think one of the things that's getting a lot of interest in, in the community is the use of convalescent plasma. It has been used in multiple uh, infectious diseases in the past. We are enrolling for this uh, patients in, at Montefiore. And if I'm not mistaken, if it wasn't the first person to donate the blood, was among the first, like, you know, volunteers, was the chair of medicine, Dr. Tomer. So I think it's like, it speaks highly of his leadership and involvement in the case here. Uh, the data was published like about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and JAMA uh, was pretty good. But again, only five patients. Uh, the ones that did respond came out of like, you know, mechanical ventilation. Some was still hospitalized on ECMO, but this seems to work wonders. And you can see here the curves. So with this, I think we can, uh, you know, show one data from the steroids before we move to the cases. Um, Steroid use, uh, this is observational data from the study from Dr. Wu in China, published in the JAMA, uh, Internal Medicine, and suggests that patients who were treated with methylprednisone did better. Again, this is not a randomized clinical trial data, very small numbers. Look at the numbers in the Kaplan-Meier curve, it's really minimal, but there is some evidence of, you know, uh, biology here, like suppressing uh, inflammatory response could work. There is data for observational data now, so I think the clinical trials have to be uh, conducted so we can see whether or not steroids do have a role in this disease process. And if they do, what part of the disease process should be using this? Other issues that you can talk about when you get to the questions and answers, you know, is uh, the use of, you know, PPEs, uh, the use of anticoagulation in the D-dimer cutoffs. I know that the cardiologists are very interested in, in this situation. And obviously, you know, pronation, ECMO, and the biomarker panels that we've been like using here. With that, I will uh, allow Dr. Latib and Miguel to have a wonderful discussion about two very interesting cardiology cases that we had over the last couple of weeks. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, I just make <clears throat> maybe make one more comment about some of the data that that Jean Fonte showed. You know, one of the challenges in the US and that all, many of us were concerned about was the fact that you know, we do have a private healthcare system here, which is, you know, majority of the health system is a private healthcare system in New York. And there was some concern initially how a private healthcare system with all these different hospitals working independently would be able to deal with this pandemic. Um, I think what 
uh, has come through and, and what's really important is the importance of leadership. Um, and what we what happened in New York was really we had our governor, Governor Cuomo, who really took on the fight almost as a general would uh, taking on a war. You know, and one of the first things he did was almost nationalize all the hospitals in New York state. So all of our, all the hospitals suddenly were no longer working independently. They all worked for the governor and all of us as doctors became nationalized as well in the sense that we did basically what the governor asked um, and that allowed then for the governor to decide where the most resources were needed which hospitals were the hardest hit and to make sure those hospitals had enough ventilators enough personal protection equipment but it does really require in this time very strong leadership that may that starts all, almost at a governmental level um, to really look overlook an entire region and decide and make decisions that are best for that region. Uh, and that really, when that happened, it started making a huge impact in New York on how we dealt with the pandemic and how we used our resources. So we did want to bring this back to cardiology because since we are all cardiologists on this call, um, and one of the, when the initial data came out of China and as well um, out of Italy, I worked in Italy for 12 years, so I had a lot of friends uh, in, in Milano who were fighting the epidemic and there were three weeks ahead of us. And so we learned a lot from them uh, about what to expect. This is essentially a respiratory disease, but we did learn early on that there are cardiovascular manifestations of COVID as well that are important for us as cardiologists to know. Those manifestations are quite varied. Okay, um, And rather than going into them, we thought the best way to talk about them was to show you two uh, cases that really illustrate some of the challenges that we as cardiologists will face during this pandemic. Hopefully those cases will generate some discussion for us afterwards. Uh, and also I think hopefully we'll have some time to talk about how we've reorganized our services uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, in particular, how do you continue to ensure that you're providing cardiac care to the thousands of patients who suffer from cardiac disease. So I'll, I'll hand over to Miguel, uh, who's one of our interventional fellows, uh, who's also now not working very much as an interventional fellow, but is working more as a uh, critical care fellow in helping us to look after critical care patients and ventilated COVID patients. Go ahead, Miguel. Okay, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? I just wanna make sure my mic is working well. Yes, we do. Okay. And you can see my slides, I hope. So I'm going to talk about two cases. The first one I titled an unusual STEMI. This was pretty much a wake up call for us, uh, kind of our index patient in the cardiology division um, at Weiler Hospital. Uh, this was a 51 year old man who had a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And he worked as a customer service representative as, at a major international airport here in New York. Uh, came into uh, one of our referring hospitals with a syncopal episode. Before that, he had had four days of malaise and fatigue, and uh, he had a short episode of self-limited chest pain right before the syncopal episode. At the outside hospital, an urgent CT head was performed because of the fall he sustained, and that was normal. This was his uh, admission EKG. And as you can see, there's a pretty classic uh, anterolateral uh, STEMI um, presentation with reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. So he was urgently referred to the cardiac cath lab at our hospital, which is uh, in close proximity to the hospital he presented to. This was his initial physical exam as reported. Um, nothing really of note except for some tachycardia. He was afebrile at the time. And these were his initial laboratory values, uh, slightly elevated uh, Y count and uh, normal hemoglobin, slightly low sodium, slightly elevated LFTs uh, or liver function tests and uh, uh, elevated uh, pro BNP. Um, he was transported to the cardiac cath lab and underwent an urgent coronary angiogram. And as you can see in the still frames here, there was no obstructive coronary disease. Uh, you can see the left system on the left and the right uh, coronary artery on the right. His LVDP was 21 
and his uh, left ventricular gram showed some apical akinesis with an EF of 55%. Um, the, uh, uh, he was then sent to the recovery area in our cath lab where he had an uneventful manual sheath pull from the right femoral artery by the interventional fellow. The temperature was taken at that time just coincidentally, and it was 98 degrees Fahrenheit, which is normal temperature uh, about, uh, 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 you know, he was a febrile. Three hours later, he developed rigorous and tachycardia. Uh, his blood pressure was 108 over 70. Uh, he was given, given meperidin for uh, pain and discomfort. Reportedly, his blood pressure dropped then to 65 over 50. He had no evidence of hematoma or bleeding from the femoral site. He was given IV fluids and his blood pressure improved, but then he was noted to have some ronchi reported by the uh, physician's assistant who was at the bedside. The blood pressure was then 90 over 50 and he was admitted to the uh, 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 cardiac critical care unit. He underwent pan cultures. Um, in the uh, CCU over the next 10 hours after the left heart cath, he was persistently febrile, very high fever, 103 Fahrenheit. Um, uh, this persisted until the next morning, and his blood pressure remained uh, in the 90 to 100 range systolic. He was only requiring two liters of supplemental oxygen. Uh, within the, the differential, uh, COVID-19 was considered a general respiratory panel was sent and that was negative hiv test was negative he was started on broad spectrum antibiotics and a covid 19 uh, uh, nasal swab test was sent uh, a ct of the chest was also obtained urged by uh, infectious disease the next morning and that showed thickened interlobular septa with bilateral small pleural effusions and these findings were uh, mostly suggestive of heart failure i'll show you those images but first i wanted to show you some images of his first echocardiogram as i mentioned before the first lv gram was reported as a, a, a ejection fraction of 55 percent however by the next day this is how his echo looked he has a, a depressed uh, ejection fraction and uh, apical akinesis. You can see it um, on both the parasternal long axis and the four chambers. Uh, let me see how we move forward. This is the images from the CT chest. You can see bilateral pleural effusions here, septal thickening, uh, not really any peripheral ground glass opacities, which is what we have more classically seen with COVID-19, so this CT chest more suggestive of heart failure. In the following days, he had persistent tachycardia, intermittent hypotension that was treated with IV fluid boluses. There was a question of his real hemodynamic picture, so uh, we placed a pulmonary artery catheter to clarify the picture and decide on further therapy. At this point, he had increasing oxygen requirements, persistent fever, rising uh, liver function uh, uh, test or liver enzymes, and the troponin was rising also to a, a peak of around three. His pro-BMP continued to rise to 3,000, uh, and uh, uh, an echo was repeated that was read as an EF of 40% with severe apical akinesis. The, these are the pulmonary artery catheter numbers on hospital day two, so his MAP was 84. And as you can see there, he has biventricular elevated filling pressures with a uh, 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 low PAPI and high CVP to wedge ratio, suggestive of biventricular failure. His cardiac index was 1.9. And at that point, he was started on the butamine and nitroglycerin. Uh, interestingly, the COVID-19 testing that was obtained uh, um, uh, was added on to the respiratory viral panel, and this was tested in-house that resulted negative. Additional samples were collected that day and they were sent to Viracore, which is an outside lab, and those returned three days later and they were negative, both of them. Later on the March 15th, when both of those tests were reported negative, the Department of Health, where another sample had been sent, called uh, to alert the staff that the uh, patient was indeed positive for COVID-19. So I did recommend it that he was treated with uh, uh, chloroquine, 500 milligrams every 12 hours, and uh, Calitra every 12 hours. Uh, 
So he was later transferred to uh, uh, our bigger hospital where we were trying to consolidate care for the COVID-19 patients early on in the uh, epidemic. Uh, and there he was uh, uh, treated with inotropes, diuresed, uh, and interestingly, his COVID-19 PCR was repeated 12 days uh, into his hospitalization and it was still positive. Eventually he was weaned off the butamine, his fever slowly resolved, the Kalitra was discontinued after publication of the trial that Joao alluded to earlier, and uh, chloroquine was continued for a total of 10 days. He was discharged home in stable condition after four weeks in the hospital. This was his last echo before discharge. He has improved, improved in his, um, in his uh, uh, EF. Let me move forward there. So uh, this was uh, the first case. I don't know if you want to make an intermission here to discuss or if you want me to go ahead and present the second case. So this the, essentially this patient was treated with supportive care with a presumptive diagnosis of COVID-19 related myocarditis. Um, and he improved. No specific treatment with steroids or IVIG was given to this specific patient uh, apart from the chloroquine. Maybe I'll just make some comments because the two cases are very different. And I'd also like to see if Dr. Carisi has any questions. Um, but a couple of questions, I mean, comments I'll make. Um, this was really the first case we saw in cardiology uh, with the COVID-19 presentation um, with the sort of myocarditis type presentation. And since it was the first myopericarditis, sorry, with marked ST elevation and then depression, uh, of LV function. And it was the first case we saw, and we thought then we will see many of these cases afterwards. I have to admit, uh, we've not. Um, you know, if we look at our data on um, COVID, and we look now at the first thousand patients we've seen at Montefiore, this is actually probably the only patient we have with a COVID myopericarditis or a COVID-19 cardiomyopathy. So that is not the most common uh, cardiac manifestation you are gonna see. It did highlight for us as a group a number of important points though, um, and which were unrelated to the, the, the cardiac disease. And probably it was the most important point we learned from this was the importance of PPE and personal protective equipment. Now, depending on where you are in your phase or where you are in the pandemic in your own country, um, there are different precautions you need to take. All right. Uh, we were at this stage starting up our curve, but already at a stage where community spread was very common. And when the team who went in to, to perform this procedure did not use appropriate uh, personal protective equipment, they just used a surgical mask, gloves, everything you would normally use for a normal cath procedure. And when this patient then became positive, I can tell you the amount of anxiety it caused to staff who were in that room okay, was very high. People were very concerned. We had to isolate staff and keep staff at home. Uh, fortunately, no one got infected from that patient, but it did start highlighting how as you have more and more patients who are in your community and hospital, you have to treat every patient who comes to the cath lab as being potentially positive, even if they have no symptoms, right? This patient was a perfect example where the patient had no fever, had no cough, uh, had no myalgias, which are the classical symptoms. Uh, and so we went into the procedure not protecting ourselves. And then within a few hours after the procedure, developed uh, symptoms. And so I would say that, you know, as you start to see more patients, treat every patient as if they're COVID positive. Um, the ones, what we've done in our cath lab now is we've divided the cath lab into two areas, uh, into a clean area and a dirty area. In the dirty areas where we're keeping our, the patients who have COVID, but also where we keep our dirty cath lab. And then we have a clean area where we keep our clean cath lab, uh, our, our patients where we think are negative. Having said that, we treat every single patient as if they're potentially positive and could infect us. And so we use full PPE, including N95 masks in all our patients. The other thing that we didn't do well early on, okay, which is a word of advice to you and your teams, is um, universal masks, okay? The one thing I think makes a really big difference in the hospital is to wear a mask all the time. So every staff member 
should wear a mask all the time. We also, when we brought patients into our cath labs or into our, uh, you know, into our pre-cath area to, to work up, we, we put a mask on the patients as well. So I think just a normal surgical mask, if we all did universal masks, it would really decrease the amount of spread that happens in the hospital. Yeah, let's see, I would like to, uh, wonderful comments. I 100% agree. I'd like to add a couple more, uh, especially in the Equalab. In the beginning, we we're not giving N95 to the Equitex. And in Brazil, cardiologists, they scan the patients uh, most commonly. So I think that we move to now every patient, as you mentioned, is COVID and two proven otherwise. A negative test does not rule out COVID at this point, which is also very important to know. And to this day, to have over 10,000 healthcare workers in the United States who have tested positive for COVID among a lot of our own cardiology staff and front desk personnel. So I think we cannot emphasize enough the importance of PPE universally. I think the other things that we did in our hospital were interesting is that visitors were limited, were given masks, temperatures were screened. We we're trying to really mitigate disease even in the hospital, which is probably the worst place it could be right now. Thank you very much for this comments. Actually, we are just, as I said, we are not so sure. We are just in the beginning of this pandemic. We are in a social isolation, I would say, for the last three weeks, two weeks, three or two weeks. But still, we are not in, uh, with a high volume. And there are a lot of pressure for us to go back to work and to kind of slow down the, the isolation, but also not to use a lot of PPEs. But it's really good to hear that. Sometimes we were just faced with cases that are completely not really must be or couldn't be related with COVID in the entrance to be something related. I would just ask Leandro and maybe Naz if they want to, tell, uh, to ask or to make any comment about the case. Uh, let, let me ask you one thing. Well, first of all, we, we are uh, using masks, okay? Uh, we just took the masks for, for the minute, so just to let, to let you know. Just to let you know. I mean, we know that uh, when we think about uh, uh, superventricular MI, we're talking about primary and job boost, okay? But now, with this COVID pandemics, we are more and more listening about thrombolytics. Uh, because ambulance took a long time, because, you know, cath labs are uh, not at the same, same rhythm and the same uh, volume. And I would like to know what do you think about this thrombolytic use, and specifically in this case, I mean, with an EKG like that, the patient was far from the hospital that could do in a cath. Uh, would you use thrombolytics? I mean, we, we know now, uh, we now uh, know that that was a myocarditis, but at that point in the beginning, what do you think about the thrombolytic? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, the question of thrombolytics. and. It's something we've been discussing a lot as a team. Uh, should we start using thrombolytics uh, or not? There, there are advantages and disadvantages, right, uh, of thrombolytics. I think we all know about the risks of bleeding and the risks of not completely recanalizing the artery. But in the context of COVID, there's some specific things to take into account. Um, in a patient who's known with COVID and who has pulmonary manifestations, okay, there, are, there is some concern that giving those patients thrombolytics may increase the risk of bleeding and may increase the risk potentially of alveolar hemorrhage. That has been one of our concerns. The second concern has been the fact that, you know, COVID positive patients may have normal coronary arteries and they may have this myopericarditis picture. And so you would unnecessarily expose that patient to a thrombolytic and the risk of bleeding. But the third and probably the most important one uh, for us has been the fact that we've seen how our volume of STEMI and, and, and STEMI has declined dramatically. Right? In Montefiore, we, are, uh, we, we have the highest numbers of STEMIs and end STEMIs, but particularly STEMIs for the whole of New York State. We see more STEMIs than any other hospital in New York State. So between our two campuses, we see about 40 STEMIs a, uh, a month. Uh, which is a large number. That has gone um, down from about 40 a month to probably around about 10 a month. Uh, it's decreased dramatically. This is despite the fact that we've now centralized our STEMI service. We closed 
the cath labs and the STEMI service at one of our hospitals. We've told um, our the uh, emergency medical sy uh, systems, the fire department, all our referral hospitals to send all their STEMIs to one to one institution. And despite that, we're still seeing maybe in a week three STEMIs in a week if we're lucky. Okay, three or four STEMIs. Now the big question is where do, where have all the STEMIs gone? I mean, clearly their patients are still having STEMIs. Uh, they, even though they're at home, they may not be exercising as much or getting stressed at work, but they're still having STEMIs. The patients are scared to come into hospital. They're scared of getting infected when they come into hospital. And so the STEMIs that we do see, that do come in, present very late as well. We've had a number of patients who come in 9, 10, 12 hours after onset of symptoms. And when you ask the patient, you say, but when did you have symptoms and why didn't you come in? They say, well, I was too scared to come in. So I just walked around with my LED occluded, okay, for hours, hoping the pain would go away. And eventually, when it didn't go away, they came into hospital. Now, some of those patients will just die at home and they'll be what we call the collateral damage of COVID. Um, so the fact that many of our STEM is are late presentations is also another reason why we've been concerned about thrombolytics and have said that we know that thrombolytics don't work as well in late presenting MIs. You know, the best uh, data for thrombolytics is within two to three hours of symptoms. That's when you get the best reperfusion. We, so for now, we continue to provide primary PCI. We did say we, do, we have a plan in place that if we become completely overrun with COVID and to a point where we have to use even the cath labs to ventilate COVID positive patients, which has happened in some institutions in New York and even some institutions in Italy, at that stage, we will stop primary PCI and we will do uh, thrombolytics. But for now, we, we believe it's important to continue to offer primary PCI. Just to share, I will let Leandro has another comment, but we are seeing the same here in Brazil or in our state. We have in some hospitals two or three cases of STEMI per day, and now we are seeing that amount per week. And we are just wondering because just they are not presenting. But it's interesting this aspect to not move on to the protocol to thrombolytic therapy because of this aspect. Leandro, yeah, no, Brazilian society is estimating 70% the decrease of uh, cases here in Brazil. But let me ask you another thing that uh, uh, people is uh, really discussing about these patients that are not coming to the hospital, right? And like some days ago, there was uh, a big news that came from New York saying that 800% more people were, were dying at home. And I, I went to check this reference, and in fact, it was a site from one guy that wrote that. And this, you know, just turned viral. Everybody was talking about that. So everybody was using this argument to say, okay, people is dying at home because of MI. The next day, the New York Times was saying that there was 100% increase in people dying at home, but they were talking about COVID patients. They were saying, well, you know, people is dying at home, so this means that COVID patients is, is uh, dying more at home. How are you, I mean, you're in the center of this pandemic, how are you dealing with these two information? I mean, do you, uh, do you think that we're talking about 100% and more COVID patients, or do you think we're talking about 800% and more cardiologic patients? Yeah, that's a that's a great point, Leandro. I you know we all saw both those sources, and I agree with you that I um, I don't believe the source that says eight hundred percent. It comes from a physician, a website. It's not been validated, so I I struggle to believe that that's the true number. I don't think we are going to know the true number until another few months. Okay, and we'll only know the true number when we compare what the all cause mortality including COVID, um, was for this period compared to what it was the uh, previous years. And then we'll see. it. I have to say, though, speaking to my colleagues in Italy, um, as well, who are further ahead than New York in the, in the pandemic, they have noticed already that they have some data showing that all-cause mortality has increased in this period, that the number of patients found dead at home okay, has significantly increased. So I don't know the exact number. I'm sure it's going to be 
you know, double the mortality, all cause mortality is going to be double what it usually is because I, you know, what we do in cardiology, especially in the setting of STEMI and STEMI, it's, you know, those are the interventions that save lives and, and yeah. make a difference in mortality. So I'm sure we will see that, but I can't give you an exact number as to what it is right now. Yeah. Uh, excellent. I agree, Latib. And just to add two points, I think that Sky is one of the interventional societies here in the United States has started a registry uh, to take a look at this uh, exact question. The reports from Italy do show like a 70% decrease, which is exactly our observational firsthand experience. So I think you're trying to at least do that systematically so you can add to the body of knowledge. And the second thing as a cardiologist, like we have moved to telemedicine. And unfortunately, I have to say, a couple of my patients where I you know, have been calling for the last couple of weeks, some of them have been found dead in their apartments. Uh, so I'm not surprised. I think it could be both from cardiac disease and from COVID. I had a patient that you know I called yesterday, she was 33, had a history of cardiomyopathy, low EF, recovered, was doing well, got COVID, went to the hospital, was discharged, and passed away two days ago. So okay. unfortunately, we are seeing this double heat and these indirect uh, you know, consequences of COVID, as Dr. Latib has pointed out perfectly. I think let's go to the second case, um, because I want to make sure there's enough time to answer some questions from uh, the attendees who are joining this remotely. Miguel, can you show the second case? Yes. Let me see. Um, you can see my, my slides, right? Yes, go ahead. OK, so this is a second case. Uh, uh, this was a more usual STEMI, LAD thrombosis in a patient with COVID-19. So this is also a middle-aged man with hypertension, gout, and a history of renal transplant in 2018. Uh, he was still on calcineurin inhibitors, tacrolimus, and he presented uh, to a referring hospital with one day of chest pain and dyspnea. His initial EKG showed an anterior STEMI, and he was treated with aspirin full dose and ticagular 180 and a push of heparin 5,000 units and then transferred to our hospital for primary PCI. And this was his presenting EKG and anterior lateral STEMI. Uh, and uh, he was, uh, at the time of first physical exam, was afebrile, I put this temperature now at centigrade, heart rate of 90, blood pressure 148 of 101, and respiratory rate of 22, saturating 97% on room air. He appeared comfortable, and his physical exam was mostly unremarkable. So this was the coronary angiogram, the first picture, as you can see, shows a, a subtotal LED occlusion with a very large and mobile thrombus um, in that uh, uh, proximal segment of the LED, as you can see there. There's poor distal flow in the LED already. This is the RCA picture. He has no significant disease in that artery. His LVEDP was seven at the time of this cap. Uh, this was uh, 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 the PCI picture. There's a, now a wire in the LED and a wire in the circ for protection. There's poor distal flow in that LED. Um, let me see here. And this is uh, uh, a picture of uh, uh, in between when we first deployed the stent. And this is the final pictures. Uh, you can see there's a stent now in the proximal LED, which is patent and poor distal flow. And uh, this is another view of the same with poor distal flow in the LED. This patient was treated after cath with, uh, uh, or during the cath with intracoronary adenosine via a microcatheter, and he was given 2B3A inhibitor bolus plus infusion, continued on dual antiplatelet, uh, and his echocardiogram showed the normal EF with apical akinesis. And uh, because we now have a high index of suspicion, as Dr. Latib mentioned, uh, and we measure the temperature in all patients, but in this patient particularly, because he had persistent dyspnea and a normal LVDP, we started to be very suspicious about COVID-19. Uh, we wore PPE during the procedure and uh, sent a nas nasopharyngeal swab for COVID-19. This resulted positive, 
and he was started on hydroxychloroquine 400 twice a day for the first day and then daily for four days. He was treated concomitantly with ceftriaxone and doxycycline for a question of bacterial co-infection. These were his laboratories. Um, they're remarkable for, uh, you know, hyperglycemia. He was diagnosed with diabetes also during this admission. He has leukopenia, which is a common trait with COVID, but this patient has a chronic leukopenia, uh, um, uh, and he had mildly elevated LFTs. His interleukin-6 was severely elevated. His LDH was elevated. His CRP was very high, and his D-dimer was mildly elevated. All these are common traits that we are seeing in COVID patients, as well as a very high ferritin. Uh, his CPK was 522, and his peak troponin was 1.32. His pro-BMP was 1,000 with that normal LVDP that I mentioned. Pro-BMP and CPK elevations have been very common traits in our COVID-19 patients, even with normal troponins, um, even in patients who don't appear to be severely ill. This was his chest x-ray. And uh, you can see some infiltrate in the periphery of his uh, uh, right lower lobe. He was treated, as I mentioned, with those medications. And uh, after only five uh, days of hospitalization, his LDH decreased slightly. So did his CRP and his D-dimer uh, remained unchanged, basically. His ferritin came down uh, and he was discharge after he completed an inpatient course of hydroxychloroquine and antibiotics he was instructed to isolate for seven days plus three days free of symptoms and he was doing well on a telemedicine follow-up visit great um thank you miguel so uh, this case highlights a couple of things important things that i want to note you know um we definitely seeing a a different spectrum of STEMI in COVID positive patients. Okay, other than the fact we're seeing late presentations in both COVID negative and COVID positive patients, that's fairly common. But one of the things we've been seeing in New York in our own practice, but speaking to other colleagues too, is that patients who present with COVID STEMIs often have a very light, large thrombotic burden, um, more than we usually see. Um, and I think this has been uh, unusual and different. It's not surprising. I think we've all learned that COVID-19 makes you more hypercoagulable. Um, we've also seen a couple, uh, you know, one or two cases of stent thrombosis. Um, we had a patient recently who came in with COVID. Stent was implanted four years ago. The patient was only on aspirin. Um, then the patient's D-dimer came back as very high. We started the patient in heparin, but the patient got a stent thrombosis in hospital. So I think that one of the things to look out for uh, is the fact that these patients are pro-thrombotic. Okay? They seem to have a lot of thrombus when they come in with their STEMIs, but also they at a higher risk of stent thrombosis. We've seen more stent thrombosis recently than we usually see, even though we have less numbers. Um, the other question that we've been also f arguing and fighting with is what's the appropriate uh, anti-thrombotic regime in these patients. So, you know, we are center that we prefer to use heparin um, for these patients, but we've noticed that the sick COVID patients uh, with heparin and heparin infusions, they still get a lot of thrombosis. They thrombose their IV lines, their radial lines. Those that are on dialysis thrombose the dialysis lines. And so in the ICU setting, in the very sick patients, we've started... Uh, using um, bivalirudin uh, more uh, to you know as a as an IV infusion in these patients because we've been unhappy with unfractionated heparin. In the setting of STEMI, we also starting to wonder uh, whether we should be using more bivalirudin in the setting of STEMI um, in COVID positive patients than heparin. So those are probably two or three of the more important. Um, sort of issues we've noted with the COVID STEMIs. Great. Uh, I'm not so sure if Nazi would like to ask a question. Uh, one thing that uh, strikes us about both cases is that we could have been discussing this case a year ago, and it would be exactly the same, and we were not thinking about COVID infection. Uh, do you see a relationship? It's really hard to say. I mean, the first case was 
are we related because we couldn't find another thing, but we, we think about other myocarditis, other virus. Uh, what's your thought about that? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, when the initial data came out, there was a lot of thought about whether COVID infection can precipitate STEMI uh, by the fact that it's pro-thrombotic, it's pro-inflammatory, can it stimulate uh, thrombin formation as well as platelet uh, aggregation, uh, and also whether the inflammation may cause a plaque to rupture. I don't believe we've seen a spike in STEMIs at all, so I'm not convinced that COVID-19 infection is causing more STEMIs than we would normally see. However, we have seen a difference in the type of STEMIs we've seen. And the reason we wanted to show this case was just because we have now a few of these cases that are COVID positive with STEMI, where we've just seen a lot of thrombus. Uh, we've been using a lot more thrombectomy, including mechanical thrombectomy than we usually do. And we've seen more no reflow than we usually have. For the two reasons, the late presentation and because there's a lot of th a lot of thrombus. Could the two be together because there's a late presentation? That's why there's more thrombus? Sure. But even in the patients who presented earlier, we're seeing more thrombus. You know, one of the other differences we're seeing compared to what has been reported before, if you look in the literature and you look at the cardiovascular manifestations of COVID, they talk about troponin rises, so direct myocardial injury. And there's the paper in JAMA that says 20% of COVID patients have a troponin increase. In our practice, it's not been that high. It's been around about 9% only. We're not seeing everybody with these troponin rises, okay? So that's one thing we've seen that's different. Um, the other thing that's been reported is the myocarditis. And I mentioned to you also, we've not seen that as common. Yeah, we've shown you the one case we've diagnosed, okay, uh, with ST elevation. We have two or three other cases in the ICU, okay, where the patients have COVID-19, severe cardiomyopathies with ejection fractions of 20% that we've done biopsies on, but they did not present as a STEMI. They presented as a myocarditis in a severe COVID infection. Okay, so very different presentation. The other manifestation in the literature is arrhythmias, that there's an increased incidence of arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, sudden death. Uh, we just now have looked at our first thousand patients who were admitted to Montefiore Hospital. And the cause of death in 97% was respiratory. Okay. In the other 3%, it was sort of multi organ failure. Okay. No patient in the, in the first thousand patients we've treated and admitted in Montefiore has died from sudden cardiac death. Okay. So I think this whole issue that it precipitates arrhythmias is not as common as we thought it is. This is a respiratory disease that causes severe ARDS with other manifestations of multi-organ failure, in especially a pro-thrombotic state. One of the differences we've seen in our institution, which I didn't hear from Italy, was a very high incidence of acute renal failure. So we, in our hospital, where we have now, as you saw, over 450 patients who are in ICU uh, or ventilated, we've run out of um, dialysis machines. We don't have enough machines to dialyze the patients because majority of these patients, once they end up on a ventilator, also end up in uh, with acute renal failure requiring dialysis. We've had to go to using peritoneal dialysis in uh, ARDS patients because we don't have enough machines. So that's one of the things we've noted that's different. I'm gonna let Miguel also make a comment because all our interventional fellows have now become intensive care fellows. Okay, they help us run and look after these patients. So they're not doing PCI anymore, but they're looking after ventilators. And so Miguel has had a lot of personal experience looking after ventilated COVID patients. Miguel. Yeah, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, you know, standing sensors of like six ventilated patients in our little cath lab ICU. And um, yeah, you're right. Uh, of those six patients, three of them are on dialysis. Um, one of them had a, a renal failure after a prolonged episode of hypoxia and hypertension. And he behaved more like um, ATN. He became a neuric and then had a polyuric phase and recovered his renal function. But the other two patients didn't have any insults uh, that we could identify of that sort. 
and then still develop renal failure that has been refractory and persistent, they, uh, they have required uh, CVVH because of hemodynamic instability, and one of them failed this peritoneal dialysis trial. We were unable to ventilate her while on peritoneal dialysis. So it's been uh, very challenging with the uh, staff shortages and the equipment shortages. Uh, the other issue uh, that is interesting and I have seen reported in other places is that even though uh, they have severe gas exchange restriction and uh, uh, their x-rays look very much like ARDS, their lungs are very compliant. Uh, their plateau pressures on the ventilator are generally low and we are able to uh, uh, ventilate them without problem. Um, but uh, uh, they have persistent uh, oxygenation uh, problems for many, many days, and we have had to prone most of the patients. So we actually have a proning team that comes around at 11 a.m. and just prones all of our patients, um, even those who are on dialysis. We've seen that this is a highly effective uh, intervention, and then uh, we, uh, 16 hours later, or sometimes 20 hours later, just supinate all of them when the proning team comes back. Uh, so it's a very labor intensive environment. Then uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, we have been using bivalirudin in all our ICU patients because uh, of the literature that suggests that D-dimer is a high marker for, mort for mortality. We have seen the D-dimer decreases with anticoagulation. We don't know if that makes a difference in mortality but we have uh, at least one patient who developed extensive DVTs while on um, um, a Pixaban before she was intubated. And then we switched her to bivalorudin. One other patient has a strong suspicion for PE um, based on his uh, 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 worsening of oxygenation when we prone him uh, according to critical care medicine. So the uh, and the last thing I wanted to mention is that we have moved uh, more and more towards the use of steroids uh, for the treatment of uh, this pulmonary uh, picture, in pa especially in patients who have persistent fever and very high inflammatory markers. We have treated them with one milligram per kilogram of methylprednisolone for five days. Uh, we have seen very strong response with improvement, especially in young patients that are very. Uh, yeah, very much in the inflammatory phase. Apparently, um, one of them uh, avoided intubation this way. He was in impending intubation, and the other one got extubated uh, uh, after after starting steroids. In the other ones, the response has been a little more questionable. Thanks, Miguel. Um, I wanted to give some opportunity to Dr. Nazi to ask a question, and then I wanted to tell you a little bit of how we reorganized the cath lab and our cardiology, interventional cardiology service during the epidemic. Uh, how are you? Thank you so much. I, I have two questions, but our, uh, first of all, if, uh, about the case, if you cons consider uh, the myocardial biopsy and the first case, and the second question is uh, how you organize the emergency department because many of our patients have uh, we, 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 we have a difficulty to estimate the and stratify the risk of thrombogenic uh, perspective of these patients. And many of them have uh, C protein elevated, troponin elevated. You, you, what's your protocol in the emergency department? So, Miguel, maybe I'll have you answer the first question. Do you know if the patient got a biopsy? Uh, and I'll take the second question. Yeah, we, we do have a protocol that uh, suggests doing biopsies uh, in patients with abnormal echocardiograms and COVID. In this patient in particular, it was not performed because uh, by the time we had an established diagnosis, we seemed to be uh, turning the corner, so to speak, just with supportive care. And so we didn't think it would change the management at that point. Other patients have undergone biopsy here. Yeah, I can tell that yesterday we had a similar case. Not The initial presentation was not at still elevation, but Dr. Jordi uh, wasn't understanding the hemodynamics of the patient. An echo was performed. There was evidence of biventricular failure. 
and uh, endocardial biopsy was performed at the bedside. So Dr. Jordi and Sasha Vuzelik, they have been leading the response to really try to understand this data. One of the questions from the audience from Miguel Ruz was whether cardiac MRI was performed. It's been challenging with the COVID to get people in the cardiac MRI, especially with the breath hold of 10 seconds is a little tricky. Uh, so for the patients who we think that there might be a hole of steroids, uh, endomorph cardiac biopsy has been the decision here by Dr. Jordi, who is doing a fantastic work at Bloodwick, trying to get some of the samples and the blood work back to the basic lab to understand if there is anything else that we're missing in this picture here. There are reports of autopsy data in patients with presumed myocarditis that did not show any inflammatory or eosinophilic changes, which is a very tricky thing. It doesn't really match what we expect with such a profound clinical finding on presentation. Yeah, I think we've we've gotten about four or five patients who've had a biopsy. Um, you know, our heart failure team are very good at doing biopsies, so they'll do it at the bedside in the ICU using echo guidance. Uh, so we don't have to move the patient down to the cath lab and put the staff at risk. Now, in response to your other question on the on the emergency department, um, you know, initially when the epidemic was starting, we um, tried to separate in the emergency department uh, and create a separate chest pain area where patients could be evaluated for chest pain if they were COVID negative. Um, very soon we realized that there were just no patients in that area, okay? And so there were so many COVID positive patients coming to the emergency room that there was no need to have an area uh, for COVID negative patients who need to be evaluated. We do though, in, in our patients who come in, um, to the emergency room and need to be admitted have a um a very clear panel of bloods that we do uh, such as you know like you mentioned we'll do on everybody we'll try and do a troponin a crp obviously look for lymphopenia do an ldh look at their liver function tests and some patients will also do an interleukin-6 uh, and we'll also do ferritin we believe those blood markers help us uh, differentiate the patient who's at higher risk for developing more severe COVID and developing more severe manifestations from the lower risk patient. And maybe the patient who has more of those markers elevated is the patient that may benefit from steroids or may benefit from monoclonal antibodies or from a cytokine inhibitor. So we do use it. As far as the troponin rises, like I said, about 9% of patients uh, have a troponin rise. If the ECG is normal, we as cardiology don't consult on the patient. We'll only consult on the patient if the ECG is abnormal. So if they call us just about a troponin rise, we'll look at the ECG, we'll do an e-consult without going down into the emergency room. Uh, we'll do an e-consult. If the ECG is normal, uh, we won't do anything further. There's no indication even to do an echocardiogram on that patient. Uh, we take that as part of the manifestation of COVID. Sorry, Dr. Nazi. Oh, sorry. You consider the CT angiogram in, in some cases? We have considered it. Um, it's been a challenge, though. You know, the more you move around these COVID positive patients in the hospital, the more you expose staff members. Okay, number one. Number two, th these patients often are also tachycardic. Okay, uh, they got some respiratory challenges. And so doing CT in a patient who's tachycardic who's breathing uh, rapidly is not the easiest thing to do. And so you don't get as good imaging. So we thought about it early on, um, but we decided that, you know, it was just gonna be too challenging and we would expose too much staff. You know, one of the things you have to realize is that once you're really in the middle of the epidemic where you're at a stage like us, where there's no more elective cases, no more elective surgery, no more elective PCI, you really have to, it's all about looking after the, the patients, but protecting your staff. Okay, and making sure that you don't get staff unnecessarily exposed or infected. You know, in our health system, we have close to 800 healthcare workers who are COVID positive. That's a lot of staff members who are, co who are COVID positive, who will then will be out of work for two to three weeks, right? Unfortunately, we've also had staff members who've died from COVID already, who contracted COVID in the hospital and have died as a result of it. Okay. So I think, you know, think about a little bit about how you redistribute and you reorganize your services 
to provide the most essential services without exposing staff unnecessarily. Thank you. You're welcome. So I wanted to maybe mention how we reorganized uh, our cardiology services, interventional cardiology services in the epidemic. So we speaking to you know our colleagues in China and in Italy, we realized that STEMIs were going to decrease and that the beds available in the hospital would also decrease. There would not be CCU beds anymore for patients. And because the CCU would be looking after ventilated COVID patients. Okay. So we thought about that. We said, how would we provide for the COVID negative patient who has an end STEMI or who has a STEMI? How would we provide a safe environment for that patient to be treated, knowing that there are no more beds in the hospital? Okay. So what we did was we, you know, every cath lab has this area or recovery area where the patients come before the procedure and go after the procedure for monitoring. We have quite a large recovery area uh, that's almost 20, over 20 beds, okay? And what we decided to do was to take our recovery area and turn it into a CCU, okay? Uh, it's not really a CCU, but in a, in a time of crisis, you have to make do. So we had a six room area with individual rooms where the doors would close, and we made that into a COVID ICU, okay? Uh, where we would look after ventilated patients because the, the hospital need more, needed more beds. And then we closed that area off. Uh, and it also has one cath lab, that area. So we closed that area off. That's our COVID positive area where we could do COVID positive STEMIs, biopsies on COVID positive patients, mechanical support, balloon pump, anything that needed to be done. And then we created another area, a COVID negative area with COVID negative cath labs and beds and CCU beds. So now a patient who has an end STEMI at another hospital or a STEMI doesn't have to go into the emergency room anymore. They can completely bypass the emergency room. They get admitted to the cath lab. They get the PCI, okay? And they, we look after them in a room just outside of the cath lab and we send them directly home from there. So it allowed us to create a safe area in the hospital where we could bring COVID negative patients who still had acute coronary syndromes, you know, we recently kept a patient who's been having angina at rest or unstable angina. Um, it allows us to still provide some sort of emergency cardiac care during the COVID epidemic. The other good thing is it allowed us to keep all our staff together. So our whole team, the nurses, the techs, the doctors could still continue to work together as one team looking after COVID positive patients and COVID negative patients. Because in many institutions, all the staff have just been sent elsewhere. And so you lose your whole team. So this was a way for us to keep our whole team intact, but also provide cardiac care. We also now staff this unit 24-7. So there's an interventional cardiologist who's there 24 hours a day. So if an end STEMI comes in in the middle of the night, um, you know, the cardiologist is there, will take the patient to the cath lab immediately. In, in, the, in the hope to decrease the amount of time the patient's in the hospital so that, you know, we now will cap a, an end STEMI day or night, treat the patient and try and get the patient home as quickly as possible to decrease their risk of infection. So that's something maybe also to think about uh, as your, you know, the numbers increase in your city. Uh, if I have time, I, I want a, a last question. Is it possible, Kariz? Yes, of course. Yeah. Chief. <laughs> we have a great discussion now about how we, uh, we treat the lockdown uh, and how you gradually uh, realize and uh, uh, put the, the machine again uh, function. How your uh, idea about this and what do you do in New York now? Yeah. Um, absolutely. I think that's something we're all fighting and about in our minds and trying to challenge. Um, I don't, I'm not sure we have the answer. We do know that the basis of this is going to be testing, is that in, in order to really reopen up New York, we're going to have to provide large-scale testing so that we can be sure that people who go back to work, go back to opening businesses will be negative. Okay. In the hospital, 
uh, a little bit different. We've already started thinking, how will we start opening our interventional cardiology service in order to be able to treat more patients as we start, the curve starts decreasing. And that's partly why we created this new unit inside the cat lab. So as we start seeing less patients with COVID being admitted, we're going to completely empty out the COVID patients from our unit and have this unit in the cath lab where patients can come in from home, get their procedure, be admitted overnight if they need to in the cath lab area, and then go home. So that there's no risk of that patient being in a normal uh, ward where there's another patient who is COVID positive. So we're thinking a lot about how will we provide services without decrease, with at the same time decreasing the risk that the patient will get infected. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Shao, I don't know if you had any other final comments or if Dr. Garizia has some questions before we finish. Yeah, no, no, 30 seconds. I think that's the million dollar question, how to reopen the economy. And I think it's, uh, it's gonna be complicated. It's a combination of public health data, science driven and economic struggle that it's, you know, in New York City now, in, New York, in the US, we have over 17% unemployment and 20 million people uh, have filed for unemployment in two to three weeks. So it's an important question. We don't have a perfect answer. I think, you know, the more we talk to different smart people and coordinate this, the better we'll be. So open to questions if you guys have any. Uh, I guess we, we scheduled this webinar for one hour. We already more than an hour here. And I guess everybody that's listening to us, more than uh, 200 almost people are participating in this webinar. I'm really uh, surprised by the all the audience that we have. This is really great. It's because we are anxious and looking forward for more information for how to get ready for this pandemic that is coming. We hope it won't be that bad as you are facing in the US and New York, but we never know. Anyway, uh, just to emphasize, thank you very much. It's really important. This lots of time for randomized data, databases, but it's a time to share experience with colleagues and it was really important for us. Thank you. And we hope some days we can talk again in a better time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.